You've heard it all before. Stories of that one depressed, lonely deprived teenager. The one that finds herself befallen by unspeakable tragedy at the cruel hands of her longtime oppressor. It's become so cliché that you might have even heard the acknowledgement of its overuse elsewhere. This image is only so popular because we are so plentiful. We come from all walks of life, all nationalities, all social statuses. We are the ones whose minds are one with the darkness they fear, the ones whose thoughts are so loud and intense in their heads they find them whispering them aloud. Speaking silent words of perpetual black into the dead night before us, to be carried by the night's chill into other obscurity, projecting our madness to the full moon, that we may carry some sanity within ourselves, but always to no avail. Perhaps this is all I do now, speak words into the silent midnight so pitch black that they meld into it only to find the company of other deranged minds, whispering the same maddened thoughts, never to meet through the stone barriers of shyness. Enough of this, however. You want to hear tales of monsters, curses, tragedy, spirits. Those who hunger for such anomalies of the abyss must have enough dark thoughts within themselves. You don't need mine as well. In my ghetto, inner city school kids exchange whispers of an old myth passed down from the upper class men, mostly just to scare the freshmen, or act like they've involved with their school. Either way, it goes as this. A few years back, there was a young freshman girl who was eager to begin her glorious high school career. She would spend every hour of night during the week preluding the start of the new school year dreaming pondering and inquiring the wondrous things to come. No more asinine. Busy work. The next four years would dictate where the rest of her life was headed. Then the first week came. It went perfectly, better than she had imagined during those anxious, hopeful nights. Everybody adored her. Her classes were mild and challenging. It was cruel, as if fate had deemed she should live her dream for a time as a mere jest, just to show her what she was missing. To show her what she would be missing for the rest of eternity. She woke up after a relaxing weekend alone. She could feel joy and anticipation dancing in her young heart. She was so oblivious, so confident, so strong. Alas, it would not be enough. Her mum drove her to school as she did every day. There were one turn away as a smile cracked on her face. A smile that would be warped by evil odds. A face twisted by the devil's cruel fire. A face that would drag many others with her into the burning abyss. What were the odds? A large truck smashed into the passenger side where she was sitting as they began to make the turn crumbling the feeble metal structure into a steel tomb. The engine began to catch fire, and smoke began to fill her lungs. She could see through the shattered glass the broken image of a desperate mother, smashing her fists into the steel to free her, with a man behind her on the phone. Her seat had curved and the door was smashing like tin foil. Only one opening revealed itself in this burning prison. It was a crack in the glass by the corner of the windshield. She knew that she could stay idle, the smoke would choke her out, and that was no way she wanted to die. She reached out and touched glass, only to rear back in pain. The glass was searing hot, parts of it even melting from the fire. She knew what she had to do. The image of her school and her future infuriated her with an inhumane seal. She forced her mouth onto the opening and breathed the fresh air, all pain ignored. Her lips peeled back with the heat like plastic to a match. Her hair singed and dissipated. Her flesh warped and cauterized, in place like human clay. Several minutes passed in this agonizing state, until through the broken windshield red lights flashed and sirens surrounded over a mother's hysterical cries from watching her beautiful daughter changed into this monster just to survive. 
She spent three blind bitter months in the hospital, the white gauze masking her hideous transformation. Then the day came. The mask was taken off, though nobody could quite find the appropriate reaction. Her lips were charred black outlines for her melted teeth. Her lower jaw seemed almost unhinged. Perhaps, worst of all, was that look of pure bitter sorrow and spite. When she herself saw what she was, she refused to speak a word, not that it was easy without proper lips or a functioning lower jaw. She spent the next miserable month in her room, unfit to return to school. She began diving deep into the internet. Perhaps a sick part of her wanted to see a stark underside, just to prove to herself she was not the only one. She eventually couldn't take it. She didn't want to be seen. She couldn't be seen. She logged onto Wikipedia, created a blank page, and began furiously typing all her spite, all her hate, pouring her heart, channeling her very soul into that page. The story goes that once she had poured all of her soul into that page, she had no reason to stay anchored to her broken body. She parted before she could post. That page remained blank for some time. The students then fabricated a myth that should you stare into that blank page for too long, she will suck your soul into it with hers. This is that page. Now, you might ask yourself, why am I going here knowing this terrible myth? Am I some kind of skeptic trying to give you a scare? No, I am here because I am alone. Because here I have someone like me. Someone to whisper dark nothings into abyssal silence with. I'll be joining her soon, and you'll be joining us. We dark-minded people should stick together. Misery loves company, and with each stolen soul this abyss becomes that much less of a void. I do apologise for ruining this page's blank reputation by the way. You are dark-minded like us. It's time you tragically joined us in our little blackness. Of all these pages to choose from, what are the odds? An acute blade lay resting in her chest. I left a gaping cut hole in her flesh as it voyaged its way out. Blood spilling out from her laceration and drenched her thin white tank top, colouring her clothes in red. The white mask killer evaded the scene. I described it as too cliché. Horror movies were my favourite form of passing time. However, many ran into the same issue of being too simple plotted. I sat there on the couch eager for every hour to pass, for I was being paid by the hour. It was a Friday evening, more along the lines of twilight as the sun had just dipped over the horizon and I was stuck babysitting. Two parents had abandoned their children for the week to venture through the open ocean on a cruise. I stood in their place, watching over their children. They had a younger daughter, who was no older than a year, and a son who appeared to be around the age of ten. The two hadn't caused much trouble from what I noticed, however I had only been with them for a day. Before going to bed, I noticed that the younger son, Tommy, had his bedroom door open, I rolled my eyes that I would have put him to sleep. I walked into his bedroom and something surprised me. His room that he had gone to for bed was empty. I would never entered it before, but I was surprised. There literally wasn't a single piece of furniture or a photograph. There was nothing but the blue paint on the walls. I turned around and Tommy stood there staring at me. I jumped out of shock. He looked at me with a grim appearance his glossy brown eyes gazing directly to me, his mouth staying static and unmoving, and his nostrils flared. He spoke in a grave tone, Don't come in my room. I looked at the kid with a bewildered face. I scrunched my eyebrows and rolled my eyes. Okay, I said, thinking to myself he is an odd kid. That evening, I tumbled back and forth in bed, fighting for sleep. I felt uncomfortable and unable to sleep. There was banging noises echoing through the house. I was sure the creaking was natural though. 
When I awoke that summer morning, I went to check on the daughter Elsie. She was crying and bawling. I picked her up to try and calm her, but something else drew my attention. She had a marking on her arm. There was an upside down star marked on her. This seemed rather unsettling, but I was sure it was some game the children had played. One of my favourite pastimes next to horror movies was taking photos. Photos of nature, of people, of architecture, namely anything. I thought to myself it would be the best to take a picture of the two children for their parents. As the two of them were playing in the park, I attempted to snap several shots of them. Elsie had many adorable pictures. However, Tommy always seemed to evade the camera. I knew I would need pictures of both, so I called them over to a tree. When I snapped the image, I was baffled. I looked at the camera, and there stood Elsie, but no sign of Tommy. I thought there must have been some issue with the camera. Later that day, things only turned more peculiar. I voyaged my way to the bathroom, but my attention was turned to Elsie's bedroom. I cracked the door open slightly to get a peek. I could hear voices from the room. I recognised the voice. It was Tommy. It appeared he was whispering to her. When I pushed the door open further, Tommy jumped back. His eyes were glaring directly at me. I knew he was only a child, but I felt this the comforting presence. He fixed his eyes on me, not breaking his gaze. He flexed his brows and tilted his head down. He didn't speak. He was entirely silent. I looked to the boy and told him, Go to sleep, it's getting late. He turned his gaze. He looked filled with anger as he stomped into his bedroom. I believe this wasn't anything unusual for a child. Once again, I had to fight to sleep that evening, as banging and rumbling filled the home. The next day wasn't filled with much activity. Not much happened. However, throughout the day, my memory of my dream seemed to return. I slowly pieced together the vivid image I created in my sleep. There was a girl who was strapped by a rope hanging by his neck from the tree in the backyard. It seemed rather discomforting and disturbing. However, my reconstruction of this nightmare was swiftly discontinued by a loud thumping noise. I stood up and walked towards the echo. Slowly, I reluctantly shifted closer and closer to this unsettling sound. It seemed to be imminent from the room of Elsie. Once again, as the distance between the room and I dissipated, I could hear faint whispers. This time, I paused, trying to listen closer to the words they formed. It was complete gibberish. I felt uncomfortable about the situation. I slammed the door open with my haste. My eyes shot across the room, looking for the entities that filled it. I saw standing next to her crib, her brother Tommy. I scanned Tommy, and as my vision gazed to his hand, I saw in it a long sharp stainless steel blade. Tommy! I yelled. He once again looked at me with a dissipating face. Now armed with a weapon in hand, However, he flew right past me as he pushed his door shut and went to his room. I was feeling unsafe at this point and decided to call their parents. I sat in the bedroom they let me sleep in, attempting to call. It took me maybe half an hour, but they finally picked the phone up. Hello? said their mother. Is everything alright? I responded. Oh, well of course ma'am, just a minor incident. She spoke. Oh. And what is that? I spoke. Well, you see, Elsie has been great, but her brother has been a slight issue. He has been doing odd things. The mother responded. Brother? We don't have a son. My heart sank. I felt helpless. Panicked, the mother spoke. What is happening? Who is this perpetrator? I spoke, feeling more fear. He, he said his name was Tommy. He looks by 10. She then responded, sounding angry. How do you know I aborted a child 10 years ago? Are you playing some sick joke of me because you're pro-life? I realized I had no time. I swiftly hung up the phone and ran to Elsie's room, but she was gone. I turned my head, opened every door searching for the boy. Then I halted, and I remembered my dream. My head turned and my gaze stretched outside. 
and there I saw a girl hanging, strapped by her neck to the tree. This girl was Elsie. Tommy approached me. I began to track back, slowly avoiding him. He spoke. Don't worry, I only wanted her. I am lonely here, and I needed my sister. He then disappeared. There wasn't a single trace of him. I looked outside, and there was a patrol of cops. They ran into the house. I realized the parents must have called the police out of fear. I was alone in the home, with a hung infant in the backyard. I knew things wouldn't turn out well for me. My state instituted the death penalty, and after several verdicts, it was deemed my punishment. Now my soul roams the internet. I am lonely here, lonely in the afterlife. I never had any brothers or sisters, so maybe instead, I'll get you to join me. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment below. All feedback, good or otherwise, is always appreciated. If you have any creepy stories of your own, or have any topics that you would like me to cover, feel free to send them in via any of my social media. You can find all links to my social media in the description below. Until next time guys, make sure you lock your doors, stay safe, and I'll see you next video.